Welcome to Around the Empire. I'm your host, Joanne Leon, and today, July 26, 2018, journalist and analyst Pepe Escobar returns to the show. He's speaking to us from Bangkok about the new great game in Eurasia, the Helsinki Summit, and why the critical military and geopolitical situation requires that the U.S. resume relations with Russia despite the massive forces working against that. And here is that interview. Hello, Pepe. Welcome to Around the Empire. It's great to have you back. My pleasure. It's good to, good to be back, in fact, after a long, long time. <laughs> yes, right. Almost a year. So as I was saying to you we had in our pre-interview chat a little bit, I intended to go into some broader subjects, because at this moment in time, it's July 26th, I mean, there's just, it's like drinking from a fire hose, the amount of, you know, important geopolitical things that are going on at the time, right at this moment. But I'm also kind of obsessed with this article that, that Pepe published, I guess it was last week. And the title of it, and you'll find the links in the show notes is, he says, here's the real reason why the U.S. must talk to Russia. It says, a new book details why future historians may well identify Putin's landmark March 1st speech as the ultimate game changer in the 21st century, new great game in in Eurasia. And the great game is what we talked to you about last time. And this article, the subtitle doesn't really do it justice because it talks about a book. It talks about, well, first of all, it talks about Putin's March 1 speech where he kind of laid down the gauntlet, I guess you could say. And he also talks about a book. Uh, it's, um, I guess, pre-release versions are available of it, but on Amazon, it's, it won't be available till September 1st. And that book is called Losing Military Supremacy, The Myopia of American Strategic Planning. And it's by a, an American, um, it says Russian military naval analyst, Andre, now I won't get this name right, Pepe. What? Martinov. Martinov. Okay, Andre Martinov. He's an American uh, military naval analyst now, Russian emigre. Yeah, he came here from Russia, and he's a U.S. Russia uh, specialist. But Pepe also rolls the Helsinki summit into this, and also you get into a little bit of Brzezinski's chessboard. All of these are subjects which are fascinating, important, and I particularly am sort of, they're big, they're hard to get your your head around, they're hard to understand, and especially from the perspective of an American, because you got to remember this bubble of propaganda that we live in, right? And you have to go outside, and then you have to find somebody who is trustworthy, you know, who knows what they're talking about, who's being even somewhat honest. So it's very hard to really, to get a clear picture. Of, of what's going on. And I think, um, you know, this is a uh, sort of terrifying uh, picture of what's really going on, what you describe here. So let's get into it. You know, where do we start with this? I assume we start with just setting the stage where for people who aren't aware, Putin gave a, I don't, I think everyone knows about this March 1st speech because it's the one, it's a very long speech and he spends about half of it talking about domestic issues because he's got lots of those to deal with. I mean, the country's by far not uh, uh, completely recovered from the collapse that it went through 20 years ago, well, between 20 and 30 years ago. But then he spends the second half sort of laying down the gauntlet about, and then he ends it with the infamous announcement of new weapon systems. And he plays, you know, graphic animations of these. I think there's some video in there and it sort of shocked the world and it was, completely out of character too. So that's the first thing. And then this book sort of gives the details about those systems and about the overall, um, what he calls it a myopia, a military, my, or maybe you call it that, a military myopia, where we really just don't have a clear picture of our, of what our military supremacy, the state of our military supremacy, if you will. And then, um, then the other big thing is the Helsinki talks, and then big picture Brzezinski chessboard. So let's start with 
with that speech. I don't know if we need to go into some detail about what he actually said or the importance of it. Well, the speech was uh, absolutely crucial because it was detailing, uh, of course, it was detailing uh, domestic politics for for the next five years, in fact. Uh, Russia now, uh, they're going to be involved in a concerted effort to modernize their economy, diversify their economy, invest in health, education, and uh, uh, infrastructure, you know, the kind of stuff that uh, doesn't happen in the U.S. for that matter. <laughs> uh, but it happens in China, for instance. Right, right. And, of course, uh, uh, the last part of the speech, uh, if we follow what's been happening in this past, I would say, five, six, seven years in Russia, we were expecting that this might happen sooner or later in terms of uh, Putin and uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Defense, finally losing their patience with so much BS coming out of the U.S., to put it mildly, right? For instance, I'll give an example. Um, I think it was in 2016, I wrote one or two columns for Sputnik at the time, talking about new Russian weapons that were being developed. And I talked especially about the S-500 missile defense system, which is much better than the ones that uh, Russia has been selling <laughs> east and west for the past few months. And, of course, I was uh, accused of, uh, Anna, I was daydreaming, I was a Putinista, a Putin agent, I didn't know what I was talking about, etc. And this was based on my best Russian sources, what was being filtered at the moment. And Russian analysts, they had more or less the same information that I had. And we didn't know, of course, the detail of what Putin revealed in his March 1st speech. The hypersonic weapons, the missiles that are absolutely untrackable and are. And there's, there's no way the Americans in the next five to ten years are going to come up with something remotely similar and so, but we were not astonished by anything because we knew that there was a concerted effort inside the Russian uh, industrial military complex to go asymmetrical, go ultra high tech, and try to, to do it as fast as possible. And they did. In fact, they did it, I would say, they did it uh, since, uh, let's say, 2000, less than eight years. That was relatively fast. You do you know? think that that was a sole? Russia project, or do you think they collaborated with China or another? No, no, country? no, no. This is strictly no. This is strictly strictly Russian Russian engineers, Russian know how. Obviously, later on they will be able to sell these weapons everywhere, and I'm sure uh, one of the first customers are uh, going to be the Chinese. But th there's an important background to all this. You remember the famous uh, Putin speech in 2007? That's over 10 years ago in Munich where he went to Munich, basically he, he was in front of uh, top Western uh, military analysts, diplomats, politicians, etc. And he said, look, the unipolar moment, uh, it's uh, waning. Uh, we don't agree with it. Uh, we are ourselves, Russia, and our partners, we are striving towards a multipolar world. And it's a multipolar world based on trade and commerce. Remember, this was years before the Chinese New Silk Road, the Belt and Road Initiative. When was the New Silk Road announced? You mean that? You mean the the, the Chinese, the Belt and Road? No, yeah, Belt yeah. and Road was announced in 2013. Oh, okay. Putin was already, Putin was already talking about uh, integration. We, we, we can say Eurasia integration, in fact. Eurasia, Europe as a peninsula of Eurasia and Eurasia as a whole, in terms of trade and commerce. Okay. And he was already talking about having a free trade area from Lisbon to Vladivostok, which is, which is the case for Eurasia trade and commerce integration. This was years before the Chinese came up with their own concept, which oh. is partially based in what Putin wanted. This is very, very important. Yeah, I didn't know that. I didn't yes, know that. I, I, I'm sure a lot of people in the U.S. don't know that because it's, uh, it's very simple. You have to keep tracking 
archiving and detailing what the Russians say. It's never idle. It's always connected to something they are doing or that they're planning on doing. And then when you backtrack and you read it uh, in retrospect, it was all there. The Chinese is the same thing. When the Chinese say something on the record, it's because it's already decided and it's already being implemented. When they announced the new Silk Road in uh, 2013, it's because they had uh, <laughs> all sorts of feasibility studies and internal discussions and all that. So when they announced it, it's already being implemented. They, they had already started talking with other governments in the region, Southeast Asia, etc., Central Asia. So it's, uh, uh, and that's the problem with, I would not say even vision, but uh, the 24-7 absolutely demented new cycle in the U.S. There's no retrospective memory. There's no memory to speak of. There's no background for anything. There's no contextualization of anything. It's completely crazy. No wonder. And then people are astonished. No. If you followed what was happening around you, you would be astonished. And that brings me back to the uh, our initial argument that... Uh, we knew that uh, there was a modernization process in the Russian industrial military complex. What we didn't know is that it was so far-reaching and the weapons that were announced are really mind-boggling. And now you, we don't see 3D graphics anymore. There are some actual videos. Oh, there uh, are. Some of them were released by the Minister of Defense a few days ago of the actual weapons. You can actually see them. You know, and they're already testing. They're testing the King Zhao for instance, for a, a few weeks now. Uh, they haven't showed the S-500 uh, missile system because it's, uh, it's, it's not totally... They, they had a few um, previews, let's put it this way, but it's, uh, I think the tests are going to start in the next few months, especially early 2019. So this system is going to be on the market by 2020. And oh, my friends you. tell me that they're already developing an S-600. The S500 is, uh, is coming online, and they already designed the S600. And uh, even, uh, you know, if you talk to Pentagon, serious Pentagon military analysts, they say, look, we don't have anything remotely similar to this. And it's going to take us years to do something remotely similar. And that, that's one thing that the book by Martyanov explicitly describes how these weapons are developed in an asymmetrical way because they are effective, they are developed to be used, and they, they cannot be, they cannot, it, it cannot be the price of an aircraft carrier, you know. So it has a, the budgets are really serious and much smaller than Pentagon budgets. And they work. And we saw how they worked in Syria. So uh, Martyanov talks about it in the book as well. The famous um, missile launching uh, from the Caspian uh, missile ships towards uh, uh, dash targets in Syria. Right. Five, uh, six missiles in an interval of five seconds launch from the Caspian Sea, overflowing uh, Iranian uh, airspace, and we saw the results. They had the footage, Minister of Defense had footage. All that. So uh, we see how they are battle testing what they're doing. And of course, they cannot battle test an hypersonic missile, obviously. But uh, <laughs> considering what Martyanov has described and the way, uh, the way they proceed and the way they are, uh, the, the research and technology didn't start a few years ago. It started already in the 70s. In the 70s and in the 80s, they were already perfectioning their missile uh, capabilities. So uh, there is a history behind it. It's not that Putin just decided now we're going to develop super weapons. You know, so. And I'm sure uh, uh, people in the Pentagon who are not consumed by hubris or... Uh, uh, an excess of arrogance or this myth that Martyanov describes very well in the book of our our American military superiority, they had to have an inkling of what was going on. Obviously, nobody is, after the speech on uh, March 1st, nobody in the Pentagon came out and said, no, we knew this was happening. Some of them obviously knew, but they didn't know the details. 
of course. But the most important part, I would say, uh, when you when you look at the speech on March 1st, and when you read Martyanov's book, you see that the Russians finally, this uh, theme of uh, we lost our patience and there's no point in talking to you anymore. There it is. You want a military conflagration. This is what we're developing in terms of military hardware. Now cope with it. So this was a message. And it's not by accident that by the end of the speech, Putin said explicitly, and you can see that uh, you can see it on YouTube. There are many different uh, uploads of the same speech. He says, "Well, we we were talking about this before. You didn't listen to us. Are you listening now?" So no. you have to talk the language of hardcore military weapons. Otherwise, nobody in the Beltway is going to listen to anybody. So now they are list- They have to listen to Russia, and they had to start listening to China when China unveiled the famous. Uh, aircraft carrier killer missile in, uh, in 2016, two years ago. So uh, it, it's completely crazy because we come to, to a situation where uh, still um, a military, let's say, relatively veiled threat, it's still more important than diplomatic talk. And at least when we had Helsinki, I'm sure uh, Trump understood that we need to talk to these guys. Uh, my, my best sources that have, they are not Trump supporters. They are American businessmen in New York, essentially. But they know Trump very well. And they are in contact with Trump on a regular basis. They told me, look, it was the Trump administration who requested to meet Putin. It was not mm-hmm. the other way around. You won't read this in the New York Times or the Washington Post. Forget it. Forget it. Because the Americans, under, yeah, at least the Trump administration understood that, yeah, we need to talk because this thing could get out of hand. And if it gets out of hand, uh, we are at an enormous disadvantage. And it's yeah. not by accident that now they, they want to talk now, uh, a few months after Putin's speech, and Russia gate imploding everywhere. Syria. It's uh, the right time for diplomacy, right? It's yeah, the right Syria. time for diplomacy. And also, it's Syria, right? I mean, it's the... And Syria, they uh, they refuse to admit uh, in the Beltway that the U.S. lost the war in Syria, period. That's it. There's no turning back. There's no turning back at all. Uh, Damascus controls uh, 90% of the country now. The only significant part of Syria that they don't control is Idlib uh, province. And the next offensive by the Syrian Arab army is going to be an Idlib. And they're going to reconquer Idlib. They already reconquered the south and the southwest. Well, there's everything. So it's, it's inevitable. East of the Euphrates, though, is still up in the air. They control 90% of everything west of the Euphrates, yeah. Exactly. And uh, it's this is something that I, I wrote about it recently as well, the interconnection of Syria and Ukraine which was discussed in Helsinki. Nobody yeah. gave us, we didn't have any leaks of uh, how they discussed the specifics. Obviously, the White House is not saying anything, and the Kremlin is not saying anything. But uh, some of the stuff that uh, people in Russia got from Lavrov indirectly uh, shows that they, they did discuss Syria and Ukraine in, uh, I would say, some detail, at least. Uh, it's not in terms of what the American media is trying to sell uh, uh, as a package. Uh, Trump ha- Trump cannot offer Putin any package because he has nothing to offer on Syria. And he has nothing to offer on Ukraine except alleviating sanctions. But the Russians, they are the states that they don't even care about the sanctions anymore. They, they use the sanctions to reorient part of their economy at least, to be more self-sufficient, cutting off a lot of imports, uh, developing their own agriculture, for instance. And they they are surviving uh, with sanctions, and now they got used to it, which was a really good thing, because uh, before that, it was monoculture. It was basically oil and gas. Now, it's, it's a slightly more diverse economy. It's a very good thing for Russia, in fact. And, of course, in terms of trade, 
if there are problems with Europeans and the Europeans are paying a much higher price than the Russians, uh, Russian business with the rest of Asia or across Eurasia is increasing. And in terms of selling uh, energy, wow, we don't even talk about it uh, because most of Russia's clients, the most important ones apart from Europe, are in uh, the Asians, China, uh, Japan, South Korea. And this market for Russia, it's ever expanding. And they're still building the extra uh, gas pipelines to uh, linking to China. They are building Nord Stream 2 to Germany. They're going to build Turk Stream, which is going to be good for Turkey and for Europe as well. So it, it's a win-win situation for them. So sanctions for them is not it used to be a problem in the beginning, not anymore. Yeah, they figured so out a way to survive. Discuss, yeah, so obviously they discussed Syria and Ukraine. Uh, and uh, I, I'm sure we can say that Putin told uh, Trump, look, uh, you know that Syria, uh, for you guys, uh, it's, <laughs> it's a lost cause. So let's try to talk about something uh, more important. Let's try to talk about Iran, which is something that apparently they did not mention. Mm. Putin said that they did talk about it. Uh, in the press conference, Putin said that they did talk about Iran, but probably in passing. Because he knows that he cannot uh, convince Trump that it was a very, very bad deal to get out of the JCPOA. Completely isolated against the rest of the planet on the JCPOA. Then we have to go back to the internal reasons why Trump do it, which uh, everybody knows. Uh, the Donners, Sheldon Adelson, that gang, uh, Bibi Netanyahu, you name it. And, of course, uh, the neocon faction, which always now. Bolton is inside the government now. And Pompeo, which is a, an anti-Iran and anti-Islam fanatic as well. So we, we, we know the constraints. But uh, uh, this, this uh, Trump idea that he can raise the stakes, Iran will fold and he can renegotiate the GCPOA under his own terms. Forget it. The only people who don't know Iran think along these lines. It's absolutely out of the question. I go to Iran almost every year. My last time in Iran was two months ago. We were talking about this all the time. I interviewed some pretty heavyweights in the government. We published this interviews on, uh, on Asia Times. And they were saying, okay, they can say whatever they want. We're not going to fold. Uh, and we, we're going to try to do business with Europeans. If the Europeans don't, uh, are pressured by the Americans, we'll continue to do business with the rest of Asia. Yeah. What about now Russia and Iran? Very yeah. complicated situation. Because now it's, it's uh, this is something I, uh, just uh, before talking to you, I was reading what uh, the commander of uh, the Goods Force, uh, General Qasem Soleimani, was saying uh, yesterday about uh, the famous Trump tweet, right? And it's very, very serious. He now, he's now saying Soleimani is not a guy who brags about what he does. He's the famous shadow commander, right. as, as he's described uh, in the East and West and Middle East as well. So now he's on the record saying, okay, if you want to come and you want to fight us, you're going to regret it. And it, he, he talked this explicitly in terms of, of asymmetrical war. And they are very good at asymmetrical war. If they want, they can really close down the, the Strait of Hormuz in, 20, in less than 24 hours with missiles, with mines, you name it. And there's nothing the U.S. can do about it, really. What, what are they going to do? They're, they're going to launch a nuclear attack on Iran. That's the only way to stop it, you know. It, it's completely crazy, it, but but it's uh, the escalation now is totally nuts, and we are still in July. This the first package of sanctions kicks in next month, and the oil sanctions kick in in November. November, right? November is going to be ultra hardcore because then we're going to have to see how Russia and China are going to align with Iran, which uh, they're going to support Iran. So keeping the JCPOA, but supporting Iran in terms of uh, China, in terms of buying uh, Iranian oil and gas, and Russia in terms of giving diplomatic support, political support, and 
they are they are involved in the Iranian uh, oil and gas industry as well, Gazprom. So uh, it's all interconnected because Russia, China, Iran. I always have to go back to the same thing in my in my articles. This is the key node of Eurasia integration. They have developed a multi-layer, very complex strategic partnership. These three. So an, an American attack on each one of them is an attack on the three of them. Is that for sure? Are they, is that a solid alliance? I mean, are they um, like Lindsey Graham, for example, who I have no respect for, but the only the thing that he's best for is that he blurt out the neocon, you know, foreign policy strategy. Yeah. And, you know, he yeah. was saying that what Trump has to do in El Helsinki is he's got to get, he's got to pull Russia and Iran apart. He's got to get Russia to, you know, basically turn against uh, Iran and pull them out of Syria, which we know is just a small part of the bigger picture. But that's and then he's saying, and we have to we have to repair our relationship with Turkey. But, you know, how much is Russia going to risk to remain a staunch ally of Iran? Because my understanding is it's a complex relationship. No, it's it's extremely complex because um, they uh, the key target for Russia, China, Iran is integrate Eurasia economically in terms of trade, uh, connectivity corridors, you name it. And this is essential for creating a multipolar world, a multipolar balance of power. Mm-hmm. What is Kissinger suggest? Lindsey Graham doesn't know anything about uh, even in his own state. Can you imagine the rest of the world? So yeah, it, right. is, it is bullshit, or he's parroting what he heard from somebody. Yeah, that's, what he's that's the thing he's good for. Is what he heard from Kissinger. Oh. Because guy, once again, who is advising Trump's foreign policy since before the inauguration? Kissinger went to the Trump Tower in November 2016 already. And in December, they met again. So he was already advising Trump even before the inauguration. And that was uh, predictably classic Kissinger. Divide and rule, balance of power. So who's the number one enemy? It's China, because China is going to be the next superpower. And China is already an economic superpower. So how do you divide and rule? You try to seduce the so-called weaker part of the equation. And obviously, in terms of uh, military power, Russia is the stronger part of the equation, Russia, China. But economically, obviously, it's the weaker part. Let's try to do some kind of uh, entente cordiale or some kind of deal with Russia and try to more or less seduce Russia away from China and, of course, seduce Russia away from Iran as well. Right. Consider that China and Iran are very, very close because of the energy relationship. It's one of the top suppliers of energy to China. So it's absolutely impossible to separate Iran and China. So... Iran and Russia, from an American Kissingerian point of view, might be possible. So this has been going on, in fact, since uh, November, December 2016. Trump could not even try to do anything before for all the reasons that we know. The civil war raging in the Beltway, in the Axis Beltway, New York, right? So now, finally, maybe he found an opening. And I asked this to some of uh, my guys in New York, they, and they told me, yes, he thinks now is the right time to try to talk to them. He, because he thinks that his back more or less is covered. And when they say his back is covered, we have to assume some very, very powerful members of the Masters of the Universe Club, right? And this is how I interpret it, and this is how my, my sources interpret it as well. Yes, he can do this now because he, he he's got it covered over there, and this is and and what uh, because essentially I would say, and it's not far fetched, the masters of the universe are saying that this uh, U.S. Russia Cold War two point zero is bad for business, most of all, 
they can do, you know, American multinationals and American uh, companies can do very good business in Russia if there is some decent relationship or, or intent cordial going, uh, going on. Cold War 2.0 is absolutely impossible. And who's going to do business with uh, Russia in the long run? It's going to be the European Union. And Trump has already identified that. Uh, and it was, it was very, very interesting the way he phrased it when he was talking about the foes. You remember, the number one foe in Trump's mind is not Russia or China, it's the EU. Oh, he said the foe, yeah. Yes, the foes. That, that was one of the best quotes, and nobody got into this quote. I think this quote was absolutely precious because he identified the competitors. Russia and China, obviously, these are the top two in the Pentagon's list and in the national defense strategy list. But he also identified the EU, which is something that he's been talking about ever since the campaign. You remember, no? Ah, the Europeans are profiting for us. Uh, They're dumping stuff. Uh, their uh, tariffs are much bigger than our tariffs. Uh, you name it. They are our enemies. Blah, blah. It's, it's the same thing that he was talking about uh, two years ago. And uh, uh, in, a, in a very Trumpian way, he uh, raised the stakes so the EU had to go to Washington to try to discuss a new deal which is exactly what happened yesterday when Juncker went to D.C. And they had a press conference uh, together, uh, Juncker and uh, Trump. And, oh, okay, we're going to start to discuss all over again. So he forced the U. And this, and this is the typical Trump negotiation uh -huh. uh, mechanism, isn't it? And so it worked. Uh, this is something he cannot do with China because China simply refuses to be pressured Period. If he slaps tariffs on China, the next the next day, no. The same day, the Chinese slap tariffs back. And if he goes on with this plan of slapping a two hundred billion dollars or five hundred billion dollars of tariffs, the Chinese are going to to slap back again. With the EU, it's different. The uh, it's still a vassal mentality, but they are more pliable, and they know they have a lot to lose as well. And mm -hmm. after all. They are caught in the middle. The, the big, big picture is the U.S. against China. And the U.S. is caught in the middle. They have to choose what are, what are they going to do next. Are we going to preserve our so-called privileged uh, transatlantic relationship? Are we going to try to get out of the sanctions dementia against Russia and try to do business with Russia again? Are we going to get into the Chinese new Silk Roads, but uh, and then on a more level playing field uh, partnership with them? So if they start projects, we start our own projects as well, and then we have you know financing on both sides, etc. They still don't know what they're going to do. They are like deer caught in the headlights mentality in Brussels, and this mm -hmm. is something that I get from my, my my friends in Brussels all the time. It, it's a total mess. They are lost. And they are trying to find a way in the new configuration. And the new configuration is a very strong, assertive U.S., a very strong, assertive China. Russia, that they say, okay, if you want to do business with us, good. If you don't, we don't care because we have our own thing going. And the Europeans are lost in the middle of all this. And I think the, um, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline so it's sort of, it's one example of, it's much bigger than all that, but it's one place where it's, you can find it all in a little myopia. It, it's, a, it, it's a very good microcosm. Yes, of, that's the word I couldn't come up with. Yeah. No, absolutely, because uh, it's, it's a deal that has been, in fact, it's a, a, a sequential deal coming from Nord Stream 1, which is uh, online, working, profitable, everybody's happy, etc. So and they need more energy, so why not another pipeline? Gerhard Schroeder is part of the business uh, elite at Gazprom. So it's a very good direct connection. The Germans are in the decision mechanism as well. And of course it's it makes sense because it's the cheapest mechanism for Germany and Northern Europe. 
what Trump really wants is to sell LNG, American LNG, to the Europeans. The Europeans are not going to buy it because it's yeah. way more expensive. And the Americans, they don't even know how to deliver the gas. It's completely I mean, nuts. And why would you? <laughs> why would you rely on just one source too? Why wouldn't you have four exactly. or five different? You know, LNG can be your backup sort of emergency, right? Higher you know, price. Exactly, as a backup. Uh, exactly, and and still. Uh, uh, the Americans will have to need a, a merchant fleet to deliver this LNG uh, across the Atlantic. They don't. As as messy as they can be, they have been trying to coordinate their common energy policy since the early 2000s, to give an idea. I followed this thing from, from Brussels very closely in the beginning of the millennium, let's put it this way. And every time it was the same thing. Ah! We depend too much on Gazprom. This is horrible. You know, the Russian stranglehold. We want to buy uh, gas from Qatar, but we can't. We want to buy gas from Turkmenistan, but we can't. It's a, it's a mess, you know. Uh, they tried all sorts of different pipelines. Never happened. You remember when they were trying to build this famous Nabucco pipeline. Nabucco is absolutely dead. Uh, this, this was uh, 10 years ago, roughly. And uh, I think two or three years ago, they they just uh, they finally found out that it will never happen. Which one is that? The one from the Caspian Sea, or yeah, from the Caspian Sea, because they could not get a deal with Turkmenistan. In Turkmenistan, they are selling all their excess gas to China. <laughs> of <laughs> Guess course, what? right. The right. Chinese went there. They talked to the Turkmen. They said, "Okay, what do you need?" We build a pipeline, we pay the whole thing, and you sell all the extra gas that you have to us. And, and that, that's it. And this has been going on for years now. It's a super deal for, the Turk, for Turkmenistan and for the Chinese as well. And the Europeans, obviously, once again, they were cut off. Qatar, the same thing. One of the reasons for the Syria war, because there were, it, it was a pipeline competition in the beginning of the Syria war. So are we going to have a pipeline that is going to be the Iran-Iraq-Syria pipeline? They, they even signed the Memorandum of Understanding in 2011, if I'm not mistaken, a few months after the beginning of the, the, the Syria civil war. So this would be a Iran-Iraq-Syria pipeline uh, going all the way to Lebanon and then uh, exporting to European customers. And that's the one Assad was, agreed to, right? Exactly. But there was the rival pipeline, yeah. which would be Qatar, Saudi Arabia, going th and going through a Sunni-ruled Syria. Assad must go uh, situation. Obviously, this never happened. And Qatar changed their mind, uh, Joanne. This, this is the great thing. <laughs> and, uh, like in the last year, Qatar finally said, this is ridiculous. It's not going to work. Let's try to work together with Iran. After all, we share the same super gas field. Uh, North Dome, South Park. Let's try to, you know, uh, we exploit this thing together, and then maybe we will build a pipeline in the future for the Europeans, which is or something the that's same. happening in the next 10, 15 years. Exactly. So but cooperate. Uh, yeah. So cooperate but with moment, Iran, and then you don't have the transport issue. That's and you don't have the, the, exactly. But for the moment, just to, uh, you know, uh, back to the basics. The best option for for Northern Europe, for, for Germany in Northern Europe, is Nord Stream 2. And there's nothing the Americans can do to derail it. Forget it. Forget, forget it. And the Russians, at the same time, they are very realistic. They finally concluded, okay, if uh, the Americans try to prevent Gazprom from doing business with Europe, for us, it's not a problem. We have the huge, enormous, uh, humongous, astonishing Chinese market. We can build five, six, seven pipelines for the Chinese, and that's it. Our future is guaranteed for decades. So they're not worried about that. that they, they have already diversified their operation. So it's not a problem. So uh, boils down to Trump trying to sell LNG to Europe. It's not going to happen. Uh, and with Iran, the thing is, he, it's impossible for the U.S., to derail a multinational treaty and try to sell a U.S. unilateral treaty to Iran. Forget it. It's never going to happen. So it's JCPOA or nothing. And they still haven't understood that. 
JCPOA, everybody, it's working for everyone. It's, it's working for the IAEA, it's working for the UN, it's working for the Europeans, it's working for Russia, for China, etc. If we don't have the JCPOA, it's very, the Iranians already said it. Okay, we pull out and then we're going to do our own thing. We decide what we're going to do with our uh, nuclear industry. So then we're, yeah. we're, we're back to scratch all over again. Uh, the, the Trump idea that we're going to starve the uh, the regime, we're going to strangle them, we're going to their economy is going to. Oh, these sanctions are really. It, it's uh, th- these are not sanctions. This is an economic war. It's extremely serious. If they go on with this threat of uh, preventing Iran from selling all their energy to anyone, which is what they are saying they are going to do. Wow, this is a declaration of war. The Iranians are going to respond. And they're going to respond with the famous uh, Hormuz um, drama. And uh, uh, Soleimani, were, were, that's what he was saying yesterday, explicitly for the first time coming from him. This guy is the, uh, okay, let's, uh, an American equivalent. He, he's a mix of a, uh, Patton, MacArthur, and Eisenhower rolled into one, you know. He's the big guy. He's the guy who knows how to win a war, an asymmetrical war. And if he's saying that, it's because he knows how. And on top of it, he has battlefield experience, which is uh, our generals in D.C. don't. They have battlefield experience in losing a war in Afghanistan and losing a war in Iraq. This is what they know. They don't know what it is to fight a very well-prepared, asymmetrical foe with some very effective asymmetrical weapons, which is what the Iranians have. So uh, the escalation is very, very, I'm very worried and it's crazy. My my sources in Iran keep, t- uh, you know, I, I, I send them emails or, uh, and they send messages back. No, don't worry. It's okay. <laughs> I said, man, look, there's an economic war against your country. How can you say don't worry? Yeah, and there are leaders, you know, throwing major threats against each other out in the public. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. but uh, but just to give you the the view from Tehran, it's they are not worried because uh, they they are confident that they can uh, outlast the sanctions. Number one, two, they are confident that uh, in terms of selling uh, energy, their Asian customers are still going to buy, and that's for sure. And number three, they are confident in their asymmetrical weapons. If, if there is a, a beginning, uh, the rumblings of a hot war, they know that the casualties uh, right at the beginning are going to be so huge that the Americans are going to say, oops, bad idea, let's try to talk. And their targets would be American troops in Iraq and Syria? Or uh, no, that uh, any sort of targets, including... Aircraft carriers. Okay, so you're talking they, more about the things in the they have ca- They have carrier killer missiles as well. So, and that's, and the Pentagon, Joanne, the Pentagon, they gained 10 different scenarios for a war against Iran. They lost all 10 scenarios. All of them. There is not a single winning scenario in a war against Iran, period. And that's why some, uh, I would not say uh, wise guys, but uh, some level-headed guys at the Pentagon, they are always, including Mattis. Mattis yeah. has already been on the record saying, no, 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 it's foolish. It's, it's, it's absurd. And the former head of the Mossad, Meir Dagan, he already said on the record, it's the most stupid idea in the world to get into a hot war against Iran. The yeah. Mossad knows that they cannot win. No, nobody can win a hot war against Iran, period. So, so what are you going to do? Uh, you're going to try uh, regime, uh, sanctions, 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 and uh, pray for re- regime change. It's not going to happen. You can agree or disagree with the... How, how can it, we describe it? The, the theocratic democracy in Iran. It's a mix of theocracy and democracy. It's a very complex system. It takes years for a foreigner to master and understand how it works. But it has 
uh, at least uh, the rudiments of a real democracy that you don't find anywhere else uh, all across the Middle East. The system is very well implanted. It's not going to be corroded tomorrow. Forget it. Forget it. And when Iran is attacked uh, by uh, an outside power, they regiment themselves, they get together, and they fight as one. This is how we should interpret what uh, Khamenei has been saying, what Rouhani has been saying, and what Soleimani said yesterday. They are all saying the same thing. If you want to pick a fight with us, you will regret it. This is essentially what they're saying. And it doesn't matter if you are the supreme leader, a military leader, uh, a faction that is uh, considered more uh, uh, reformist. It doesn't matter. Now, everybody agrees because they're being attacked by an outside power. So this is something that the, uh, the Trump administration should be very careful about. And who are Trump's allies uh, in terms of uh, trying to uh, provoke regime change? The Mujahideen e Khalq, yeah. which is a terrorist organization absolutely despised by every Iranian you can think about. And a cult, the whole and just population crazy. of Iran despises these people. Forget it. it it's a, if, if, we, if, uh, if we're talking about if, if the Americans had reliable ground intel in Iran with some powerful faction that has at least relative political power inside the Iranian system, we could even start thinking about the possibility of regime change. They don't. They have nothing. So forget it. it it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So, you know, the only thing they have then is this uh, sanctions dimension and this threat of uh, an energy blockade. This is very serious. So if we have in November... I would say a practical, tacit, explicit, working American blockade of uh, energy exports from Iran, then things get really, really serious. And then all bets are off. Man. And that's strictly driven by the this neocon faction, this same yes, neocon absolutely. foreign policy policy faction, the same ones who took us to war with Iraq and you know pursue all of these regime change. And essentially, all of these things have been detrimental to to me as an American and to our country and to our standing in the world and everything. So, I mean, yeah. and they're the ones screaming traitor, right? They're the ones screaming treason for going to talk to Russia. And yet... This is completely absurd. Uh, look, uh, the Europeans said, look, this is a great thing. At least they're talking. And Europeans have reasons to be worried because, as we said before, they are they are caught in the middle. Yeah, they have some of the biggest reasons to be worried. Exactly. Even yeah. Angela Merkel, she said, okay, great thing that they are talking. Uh, everyone in Asia, here in Asia, everybody was saying, okay, excellent, you know, finally. But uh, the, the level of... Um, uh, it's crazy when, when you when you look at the the civil war in the Beltway from the outside. It's it's not even surrealist. It's um, uh, I, I I don't even know how to qualify it. In fact, it's uh, in fact it's it, it it has the makings of a Greek tragedy. In fact, because everyone could go under in the middle of so much uh, acidity, venom. You know, it's it's, Toxic, it's absolutely yeah. horrible. Or, and it's impossible to find grounds for debate. Okay, you can debate uh, the substance of what uh, they discussed or did not discuss in Helsinki, but you cannot say that this was a bad thing. Can, can you imagine? You have headlines in America media saying it was a bad thing to meet in the first place. It's completely crazy. Yeah, it huh? is crazy. So, uh, okay, uh, I, I would say that this it, it's... It's uh, an ongoing process. The fact that Trump already said we're going to talk again after the, the midterms, it's a good thing. First of all, because he expects to win the midterms, which is a yeah, <laughs> dodgy yeah. proposition. We don't know, right? Yeah. Uh, but they want, they want to keep talking because the, he wants to strike some sort of a Kissinger divide and rule deal with the Russians. But... Uh, the thing is, he doesn't know exactly what the Russians expect, which is nothing. 
And when you when you read the best Russian analysts, they are all saying the same thing. Okay, it's a great thing to talk, but we expect less than zero from uh, this American administration or any other American administration. We're doing our own thing. Which well, is Eurasian if- integration, which is trying to get uh, back to normal business with the Europeans, and that's it. Well, even if they did trust Trump, is exactly, that because they, thought- they, 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 this is what they say all the time? We cannot trust anybody in the American administration, and this this includes everyone. And uh, okay, for the moment, Trump gets the benefit of the doubt, at least because at least uh, they are talking. The leaders are talking directly. Eh? That changes a lot. They don't expect him to offer anything tangible, concrete to Moscow. They, but even they have if he no wanted... illusions whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. But even if he wanted to, I think here's what they do understand. Even if they trusted him, the things that he says to them, the things that he might promise to them, they don't think that he can come home exactly, and overcome because, no. that. Yeah. Of course, the Russians the Russians follow American foreign policy uh, under a microscope. They know exactly what's going on in Washington. They know it, of course. Yeah. All right. Well, I think um, we've been going for about an hour now. Maybe yeah, we we'll be re- for a, we'll be talking for an hour now. <laughs> oh, I could I could talk for two days on this solid. I mean, it's just it's baffling, and yet there are things that are very enlightening about it, but it's. It's scary is what it is. Is there anything that you want to wrap up before we... You know, uh, I, I, I would, uh, you're telling me about uh, you're being scared. Can I, can I make a connection with that Gallup poll where Russia yeah. does not even register for everyone that was interviewed in terms of uh, real preoccupations for uh, an average American? That tells you everything it's it, it, it's it's a, an ex, a strict beltway soap opera people in ohio in arkansas in arizona they don't care about what what's happening with russia you know they're they're caring about the erosion of the american middle class among other things that's it that's yeah it. it doesn't come up in it doesn't come up in conversation no um, you know, course, at barbecues of no. course not. Yeah. No. Huh? No, it doesn't. But unfortunately, the people who lead us don't represent us. You know, uh, the people who are in power really don't represent us. And they do live. When you go to D.C., I mean, I, my son lives in D.C. I was just there a couple of weeks ago. I mean, it's an economic boom. Um, yeah. There's things. There's construction all over the place. It's totally crowded and packed. And there's all these, um, you know, nice restaurants. There are these great jobs, lots of jobs. And so they really don't understand what it's like in the rest of the country. They know that like this, we've been talking about this for two years, but they're not really interested in knowing what's going on in the rest of the country because the solutions aren't in their best interest. Their best, you know, it's just so much um, selfishness, I think going on. And it's, it's very, uh, it's a closed circuit. No, Uh, it's very provincial. Uh, when I lived in Washington, I was, I had lived in uh, London, Paris before New York. When I lived in Washington, I said, wow, this is a provincial company town, in fact. And, and they only talk about, among themselves, about the same topics. And 99% of these topics have nothing to do with the life of an average American. <laughs> right, exactly. It's completely crazy. Yeah. It's completely great. It's it's really a parallel universe. Well, yeah. Well, have a great time on your upcoming vacation, and I'd I'd love to pick this back up again because even just one aspect of it is it's fascinating to talk about. And um, yes, uh, we we should be very worried about November. What's going to happen in November? Definitely with the the Iranian issue and uh, how how the other players are going to react, how the Europeans are going to react the Russians, and the Chinese. And meanwhile, I would say um, how this trade war with China is going to develop or not. I think sooner or later, Trump himself is going to see that this is very bad for business and he's going to backtrack. Yeah. All right. So take care. Okay. 
And where can we find Take where care. can people Good find you work? You. Asia Times and huh? Facebook. You're are you mainly yeah, on Asia Times, Facebook? Yeah, for the moment I'm basically writing for Asia Times. Uh I stopped with the Russians for a while. It's a very complicated story. But <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll explain one day. <laughs> All right. Good to know. Good to know. And I am All on right. Facebook as well. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Take care then. Cheers. And thanks so much. Take care. Okay. No Bye-bye. problem. Cheers. Bye bye. Cheers. And that's our show. Thank you for listening. And a special thanks to Pepe Escobar. Follow Pepe on Facebook. Find his writing at Asia Times. That's atimes.com. We are independent media. This podcast is brought to you with the help of our generous donors. You can pitch in by going to patreon.com slash around the empire or by doing a one-time donation using the links on our website aroundtheempire.com. Follow us on Twitter at Around the Empire. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow our podcast on iTunes, other podcast apps. Please like our page on Facebook. Also on YouTube, it helps us a lot if you hit the subscribe button to subscribe to the channel. It's free. And also use the thumbs up icon to like the videos. We'll see you next time. Take care, everyone.